I'm very excited to be announcing our second guest here on the star stage, Barometer 2019. Before I do, I've got two quick announcements. One, if you want to keep in touch with what's happening, I'll ask you uh, to follow uh, Chatbot uh, on Telegram. Here's the, uh, the code for those of you on Telegram following the Chatbot. Second, I want to start a new tradition here at Barometer because this is a huge stage for speakers to come on. Uh, and I want the kind of reception that these guys will tell at all the other bar shows around the world about how welcoming uh, Kiev is to speakers. So if you're here at Robert Simonson's uh, talk, you'll know what I want you to do. When I introduce the next speaker, I need you to get up off your chairs and give a huge round of applause. So I'm going to have a quick practice. So in a second. I'm going to introduce Mr. X, and I want you to stand up and give a huge round of applause as a practice, okay? So, introducing Mr. X, come on! Okay. That was a little lame, but I'm sure you're going to give me lots of heart and lots of love uh, for our next speaker. You would have known and heard about him for many years, Mr. Simon Ford. Uh, with over 30 years' experience in bar changing, education, uh, and marketing for some of the world's biggest brands. He was host at Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Awards for over six years. You may know in 2012, he started his own brand, a Ford's Gin, which recently got purchased by Brown Foreman. So martinis on him tonight, I believe, when we go out. So can I hear a huge Kiev welcome for the one and only Simon Ford! It's, it's really nice to be here. I, um, the last time I did a talk for bartenders, it was for four bartenders. So this is very, very nice right now uh, to be able to share a story with you. Now, in, true to the roots and the uh, entirety of what this festival is about this year, being the roots of this culture, I put together a presentation based on that. And it's basically my version of a motivational speech. Now. I'm really bad at motivational speeches. I just want you to know that. Um, one, because I'm English. Two, because I'm very cynical as a human being. Um, but he did mention 30 years of industry experience. Uh, I wouldn't say it was all experience, but I have been in this industry for 30 years. And for those that were here for Robert's talk earlier, a lot of those things that were happening that built this industry I was the guy standing in the room watching it happen, and I was learning a lot, and I got to meet these people, and I got to see this industry come from something that was a small group of people following not even dreams. They were just doing something they were passionate about that at the time, no one really cared about. And so that in itself has inspired me, and in many ways, I believe that my career path was just about being at the right place at the right time, meeting the right people at the right time and seeing the right people at the right time. And so in following Robert's laying down the roots of the industry and the people and the places that made this industry what it is today, I want to go one step further and talk about what that led to. And from my point of view, those roots that were very much founded in those people led to communities around the world, communities of bartenders. Now, we're all in the hospitality industry, and I'm going to tell you right now that I do not believe we're in the industry of, of drinks. I believe we're in the industry of people, and that's why I've always loved this industry. It's why I've always loved traveling for my job, because when you meet another bartender, when you meet another like-minded personality, do you know what the first thing we do for each other is? We roll out the red carpet. We welcome our fellow beings, and we've created inadvertently a community just like that. You know, if you come to my hometown, 
you know I'm going to look after you. And I believe that if I come to your town, you're going to look after me. And that is what has connected everybody in this room over the last 30 years of this cocktail renaissance. The other thing, as it has grown, those ideas that came out of those people that were just doing something because they believe in it and were passionate about it and didn't know where it was going, is a lot of opportunity. Opportunities that didn't exist. Right now, the hospitality industry in the United States of America is the biggest industry that, of, of employment. This is incredible. You know, like there are more restaurants, bars, and places to go, hotels than ever before. And that has created so much more opportunity for us. Craft spirits, the need for education. And that's what this is about. The responsible part, that's not really my strength either. I'll be honest about that. But I do want to talk about it because that was what happened as the next stage in this industry. And that was, again, for those who are here for Robert's talk, was sort of how it finished. So the title, and this is the very first time I've ever done this talk, is The Roots of Modern Cocktail Culture and How Community Can Help Shape the Future of Our Industry. So I liked earlier we, the, the conversation about Greg Baum and he bought all of the cocktail books. Um, making it very difficult for others to get those cocktail books. So I don't like him for that. But what I do like him for is making that information available. But once upon a time when I was first in this industry, there was no internet. It was very hard to find that information. So of course it took so long. Today, if you want to know something about this industry, you can go on Google. You can find one or two really terrible articles, but you will eventually get a really good one that gives you the truth of where that cocktail came from. You can find bartenders. We're all on things like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And so people can know our profiles. But once upon a time, if you were making a drink and you were a bartender, that was it. It was your customers that knew who you were. And that was, and so the work that those people have done to create this industry is what I want to sort of touch on and celebrate within this talk. So Robert Simon quite in my opinion, I 100% agree with him when he pointed out that the most influential person of the last 30 years in cocktail culture is Sasha Petrosky. And I think it's amazing what he did. And I, I almost want to, I'm going to go back and sort of talk about it a little bit because 134 Eldridge Street is probably, the, in my opinion, the most famous address in cocktail culture. It's now the home of Attaboy. And it's where Milk and Honey was first opened. This is a street that was residential in what was probably a pretty dangerous neighborhood at the time. There was really very little else there. And Sasha is opening a bar that's not going to have a name on the door. It's not going to have a phone number. And it's got 30 seats. And now, I was around in 2000 working in this industry. That sounds like a terrible business opportunity. And Sasha didn't do it because it was a good business opportunity. He did it because he cared. Now, again, he innovated all of these things. Not having a cocktail menu, fresh juices by the day. But these came out of not actually learning from someone else, but actually starting to do something with his own ideas. And of course, it took off. Eventually, he will have a phone because people were starting to wait outside and it was upsetting the residents. And so, of course, he put a phone number in so that people would get reservations. Soon, that number was the most sought after number in New York. And he had to change it because he wanted to keep his regulars happy. But this set in motion the next stage of our cocktail industry. But the thing that's important and the thing that I want to sort of, you know, move on from uh, with, you know, Robert told you the story of Sasha is that it created communities. But what Sasha did was took a huge risk when he did that. That's the motivational bit, take risk. But he created communities um, and those communities went on to change things too. So Richie Bogato on the far left, he has an ice company in New York. He opened Dutch Kills. Eric Alperin opened The Varnish in Los Angeles. It was one of the first bars to open there. Um, he was named Best Bar at the Tales of the Cocktail Spirit Awards and nominated several times for Best Bartender. Toby Maloney went to Chicago and opened The Violet Hour and won a James Beard Award. 
Chad and Christy went out to Dallas and opened up Midlight Rambler because they bought their two favorite things together, music and, um, and cocktails, and of course named it after Rolling Stones. It goes on. Lucinda went on to open Middle Branch. Mickey and Sammy, Attaboy, top 10 bars in the world on the 50 best. And Michael Madrison, he was just named most influential person in the uh, cocktail scene in Australia. They are a community that was created by Sasha Petrosky. They continued his legacy wherever he went. And in most occasions, Sasha partnered with them in business and they created it together. So from one small room, Sasha has changed the lives directly of these people. And these people know this and they are directly changing the lives of the people after them. Now, how long did each of these people work for Sasha? Five years, 10 years, a long time until they were able to do what Sasha did and take the risk and open their own business. But it is inspirational that that is what Sasha created. It wasn't just that he created this amazing bar called Milk and Honey. It's because he created this community and inspired others to do it. And of course, cocktail culture blossomed, you know, and other people did what Sasha was doing. But that's a story that you can read in the proper drink. And if you saw 40 slides, that's just a snippet of what this book talks about. That book is about those people that really put in those hours and those times. But I am going to focus on a few of them. The thing is, Sasha wasn't the only one building communities around the world. You know, even before Milk and Honey opened, Peter Dorelli, who's down in the front here, was working at the Savoy. And I was picking his brain last night. 35 years at the Savoy. Just, just go, yo, if anyone's done 35 years in a bar. Right? Good job. You kept your job, Peter. And that is very impressive. Because I, 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 I would get fired after about five years. <laughs> One of my very first experiences uh, in the cocktail culture was actually getting the opportunity to go and see Peter. And he made me 30 cocktails out of the Savoy cocktail book. Verbatim, the recipe's correct. And told me about 22 of them were bad recipes and that he would change them. Now that's evolution. And that's evolution of great bars. And that was one of the first things that I ever got to learn in this industry. Dale DeGraff another person, again, I think Robert called him the most famous bartender in the world, and I would tend to agree with that as well, taught Audrey Saunders to bartend, who taught Jim Meehan to bartend, who taught Jeff Bell to bartend. There's now a PDT in Hong Kong, creating communities. Now, the, why do I say this? It's because Dale saw it as his responsibility to mentor someone. And I see it as the responsibility of anyone that has good experience to do that so that we can continue to grow this industry. And so that this industry, because we do not want this industry to go back into a place where you cannot get a good cocktail. I think we can all agree upon that. Dick Bradsell, the very first slide in Robert's uh, presentation, taught Nick Strangeway, Dre and Henry, who went on to open bars. All of these great bartenders would learn and grow, and, and are these people doing really well in this industry today? Yes, and that's, you know, this mentorship and this is idea of passing down from generation to generation all of the skills that we have literally found in this industry. So all of these opportunities were created. Now, what do I mean by new opportunities? Now, once upon a time, it was bar back, bartender. You know, now, it's gone to another level. You know, you go bar back, bar manager, beverage manager, you can take that road. Brand ambassadors, they weren't really in existence. And I think that there's probably at least, there may be as many brand ambassadors at this festival as there are bartenders. Only because we know that their trips were paid for by somebody else. Um, but as a brand ambassador, now you can go forward, you can perhaps become a brand owner. So opportunities that never existed, maybe you want one day to learn to be a distiller. And so we have this whole world. Now the next presentation I urge you to come back for by Kenji is gonna look into all of those opportunities. So, but 
when I started bartending, there was no money in this industry and really no opportunity. So we're living in a really good world. So the next part of my motivational part of this talk is this idea that you cannot become a success overnight. You know, it's about learning, it's about failing. We see Instagram. Instagram, honestly, my Instagram account shows you anything good that ever happened in my life. And if I've got nothing good to post, I find something good from the past to post it. You know, it doesn't share the struggles. It doesn't share the hardship. It doesn't share the two years I did as a bar back. It doesn't share any of those things because that is not attractive. And that's what this world has become. And, and so I want to share some stories of a few of the people that have changed this industry. And of course, I'm going to start with King Cocktail. Dale DeGroff started bartending in 1974. Is that before you, Peter, or after? Uh, after Peter. So he's not quite as experienced as Peter Dorelli, but he's been doing it for a long time. Now, 1974. We heard a story earlier of a very special moment when Dale DeGroff gets his hands on a copy of um, the How to Mix Drinks, right? Jerry Thomas's famous book from 1862. Finding that book, there was no Greg Baum reprinting it. There was no internet. Finding that book was an impossibility. And until Dale had that book in his hands, he was not making great drinks, self-confessed. That was the book that changed it. And it would be a few years more before people were even noticing that his drinks were different and better. Now, after Toby Cicchini creates the Cosmopolitan, Dale gets some fame on the Cosmopolitan too. He's doing this flamed orange zest. He's up at the Rainbow Rooms and more people. Now he's been in his career almost 30 years. And it won't be until 2002 that he gets to publish The Craft of the Cocktail, which is a seminal cocktail book that helped change bartending for a lot of people around the world, including myself. 29 years from starting his bartending job to actually getting his first book published. And then it took off for him, being flown around the world to do talks. So this is what I mean by putting in time. Now, how many failures do you think Dale DeGroff had in those periods? How many jobs that weren't right for him? How many drinks that weren't great that he served until eventually he's serving the perfect cocktail and he gets a book contract? And then his next book, what does he do? He celebrates other bartenders because that's what a good mentor does. And this is the book. And I only put this up here for a sort of, I like the idea of if you go back in history, the same thing was happening in the 1880s, 1890s, when cocktail culture was going on. You know, I, I always remember at the very beginning of Harry Johnson's book, how he boasts, he was certainly a bartender with an ego, but how he boasts that he beat several other bartenders in a cocktail competition. But he opened bars that celebrated artists. He opened bars that celebrated music culture of the time. The impact that we have is, goes beyond drinks always. It's actually the wider picture of culture. Now, this is a bartender called Rhiannon Anil. And I just met her at a bar in Louisville last week and we sat and had a drink. She'd served me many times. She is at a bar called the Erin Rose in New Orleans. Now, the Erin Rose is a dive bar is open 21 hours a day. Um, it's famous for a frozen Irish coffee drink, which is delicious, by the way. If you ever go to Tales of the Cocktail, make sure that's your first stop. It is also a delicious, it's frozen cold, it's got coffee in it, it's an amazing hangover cure. And as they're still open at 9 a.m., you can actually use it as a hangover cure too. Now, I'm not here to promote the uh, Irish coffee that they do at Erin Rose. But I am here to share her story because she worked in that bar for 17 years. And after 17 years, her shoulders are starting to hurt a little as it does with bartender's elbows. And she wonders what she might now do with her life. And so she goes and does a history degree while bartending, which takes five years. And of course, she gets uh, her history degree and then asks herself, now what the hell can I do with a history degree? So, of course, she is still bartending, not sure what the job is. But just a few weeks ago, Sazerac Spirits Company are opening a museum in New Orleans, and they needed somebody to curate 
for them all of the cocktail history, all of the whiskey history. So after 17 years and a history degree, her perfect moment has just come together and who knows where that might lead her. Now, I'm gonna take a little bit of a moment to be self-indulgent, but I started in this industry when I was 18. Um, oh, this is, let's do this one first, but just talking about Dale and talking uh, uh, you know, about Rhiannon, there's a famous saying that overnight success takes at least 10 years. There is no such thing as overnight success, and I think it usually takes 20. So I started in this industry in, well, when I was 18. I don't want to give away too much of my age. Um, and the first job I got was 20 hours a week. And I managed to get up to 29 hours a week, and then I managed to get 39 hours a week, which was a full-time job, and it was in a wine shop. This wine shop carried over 4,000 spirits and wines. And I worked for them for eight years. And over that course of that period, I got to try virtually every single bottle in that bar. And I wrote a handwritten note and tasting notes on every single one. And I learned something else. I learned how to sell a bottle. But eight years of my life. And I loved it. Actually, to, the, to, to be honest, it's still my favorite job to this day. That job would lead me to a bartending job in the bar that was upstairs from that wine shop. It was above it. And I stole all of the cocktails from Milk and Honey and another bar called The Lab, which had opened in London. And I only made up five original ones. It would be very embarrassing that a few years later it would win Best Cocktail Menu at the London Bar Awards. And I had to go up there having plagiarized their work. But they were my heroes and we share ideas, and that's how I learned. It was sort of almost me learning a mistake to come up with my own work at that time. That led me to probably the job that I think is the life-changing moment for me. I, I, I was asked to, 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 to talk about gin and research gin and train bartenders on gin. Now, this is the 90s now, and really at this moment in time, no one wants to talk to me about gin. Flavored vodka was all the rage. And so just because of that moment, I was able to connect with people like Julie Reiner, like Audrey Saunders, people who cared about this industry. They wanted to know about gin. And we were a small group of friends. They were changing the way cocktails were being looked upon in cities like New York. And I was talking about gin, and it was something we were all passionate about. But we were, this is before the Pegu Club opened and this explosion. I actually started, I started, show, now this will show my age, I started when Plymouth had that bottle. And their current bottle's not even on there right now. That's, um, but I was a, 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 a part of that journey. Now, I get to, and this is a great moment, I get to travel with Plymouth because no one wanted to work on gin. So they said, go and travel on gin. So I got... Um, the opportunity to go to Australia and New Zealand. It was like this great moment for me. And I had my presentation on gin, and I did it to a, a group of bartenders at a bar called the Matterhorn in New Zealand. And one bartender challenges me on my knowledge. His name is Jacob Bryars. He's talking later today. He's like, you're wrong about that. I'm like, no, I'm not, because I'd been given my information just from my bosses who said, go and teach gin this way. And so when I left that meeting, it turned out that Jacob was right. And at that point, I wanted to know everything about gin. I never wanted to be in front of a group and not know what I'm talking about ever again until today. But it gave me this opportunity when I got to travel with Plymouth to meet a lot of people, a lot of bartenders, a lot of communities around the world. And those communities were all changing how the world drank. That picture there, to me, represents a lot of shots that I've done with a lot of bartenders. At this point, my career is at 20 years. And at this point, it kind of goes a little bit wrong because my job's not working out that well. I'm in the US and I get a new boss who doesn't like me as much as my old boss. And that sometimes happens. But all of a sudden, a friend of mine, and it's this guy, Malte, says, why don't we start a business? Now, why do I mention this? 
I wouldn't have been able to do this if it wasn't for the communities of bartenders that I'd met because I had no idea how to start a business. I had no idea what new businesses bartenders might want. And of course, that is the only place I have ever worked and the only thing I might be able to do. But I was able to ask over 100 bartenders their advice and opinions on what they think I should do. And they told me to go in and make gin. I wish I'd listened to them, by the way, because what I did is I ended up making a lot more, I'm going to go back, a lot more spirits than just gin. And all of them went out of business except for the gin. But I, I want to point out, oh, I'm going the wrong way, what community did for me. Because community was a sounding board. First off, my hero, Sasha, and I think Robert's hero after hearing him talk, said, you need to make a cocktail gin. And he said, you need to call it Ford's. So anyone thinking I'm arrogant for naming a gin after myself, it was Sasha's idea. Just wanted to know that. But we sat and tested in cocktails and we changed it. My access to one of the best bartenders in the world helped me define a moment in, in, my, in my career. We designed a bottle for bartenders, which was well received at the time. Um, 150 bartenders, this community helped me create a bottle that would be usable and user-friendly for bartenders. And if you go to the US today, maybe England, you might see a bottle being reused by bartenders. Uh, it was, you know, there was a purpose to it. So community was able to help me. That's 2012, that's the day I started this business. I looked a lot, lot younger. The only thing you have to, if anyone ever starts a business, know that you're going to age twice as fast. It's like having children. If you have children, you will age. Start a business, you will age. <laughs> so, we end up with just a gin. And this gin has been quite successful in the US, right? And we're hoping to bring it to the rest of the world now that we're with Brown Foreman. Um, but because of community, because of bartender community, the people that decided to support this product were all the other bartenders that I had met over the years. Those are people that are judges. So I don't think for a minute we won this award because the, you know, just because of the gin's merits. I think we won it because of the bartenders and their affinity to community and the things that we do and the things that we do together because most of the bartenders that I know were a part of my journey and most of the bartenders I know helped me create this spirit and help me create this bottle and this label. So now I'm moving the goalposts. Overnight success now takes 30 years in my opinion because that's how long I've been and I don't even see myself as successful. I think I've got another 10 years and I'm hoping if I don't die that that will be everything. But I said this is going to be a really bad motivational speak, speech and I hope that it is. <laughs> no kidding. I hope it's not bad. I hope it's a good motivational speech but I just want everybody to know that every step is meaningful. From Dale's years of just making drinks when no one was caring and no one liking Instagram posts because it didn't exist, those years were meaningful. The jobs that I lost, the year that I was writing labels was meaningful. It's all I was doing was writing labels for eight years. The things that I messed up were meaningful. I ask this of everyone in the room. Keep going, right? What would have happened if Dale DeGroff got given that copy of his book, of Jerry Thomas's book, and said, nah, <laughs> I don't, I, I, I'm not doing that. I like my pre-made lime juice. I like my pre-made lemon juice. I like my pre-mixes. I'm not doing fresh juices. What if Gary Regan wasn't inspired to do bitters? But he was, you know, and when... Gary Regan told someone to try Regan's Orange Bitters. You know what happened at first? People went, nah, no one drinks bitters. That's what happens. And so I ask everybody, keep going. Because when you have an idea that's different, people are always going to challenge it. And people are always going to criticize it until it becomes the norm. And that's what's happened. Cocktails like Dale's, bitters, these are all things that have become the norm. Now... Be a part of the community, contribute to your community. Now, some of us are not the type of people that want to hang around with other people. We like to close our, our, our shop. We like to close our bar, whatever we do, and go home. But every now and then, 
There might be a bartender that comes by who's got a new idea. There might be a Gary Regan with his new bitters. There might be someone that's trying something new. I urge you to support each other, you know? Don't be competitive with each other because we're the ones changing the way the world drinks. There's a lot of mediocrity out there. There's a lot of terrible bars. There's a lot of terrible products. But you know what bartenders won't do? Terrible bars and terrible products. People from our industry won't do that. And so we need to take control. So being a part of the community can help that. And you know, if you're a part of the community, now you have people to, in which to share your ideas. What's my next? Be like Sasha, create your own community. If you have that influence, if there are those people, mentor them, you know? Again, what if Sasha was very selfish and just kept all of that information to himself? What if Dale didn't want to teach Audrey because he was the famous bartender and there was no more famous bartenders? We would have slowed down the progress of what we do. And I'm putting this one in because this is the modern way of, of, of bartender culture. 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, and this is when I'm still 20 years, I only cared about having a good time and the cocktails and all of those different things, you know, but we are in a world where the environment is hurting. You know, there are bad people and I think it's very important for us to take on those responsibilities. So I'm gonna share a few more stories. And it's one that Robert shared earlier too, but Speed Rack, its importance isn't just because it's a charity. Its importance isn't just that it's a bartender competition that celebrates women, although that is really, really important. It is a community that grows year on year on year. Now, I was at the very first speed rack. I'm, again, right place at the right time. In fact, I hosted the first season. And in those rooms that year, there was maybe 50 people cheering on the audience and it was quite chaotic and it was lots of different people were helping in those events. If you go to Speed Rack today, there are thousands of people in this room and it's raised over a million dollars and they're happening all over the world. In fact, I would make a guess that if you invited them, if Barometer Bar Show invited Speed Rack next year, they would do a Speed Rack here as part of the procession. Sorry, Ivy, if you're watching. Sorry, Lynette, if you're watching, but I think that that's what would happen because they're creating these communities. They're doing one in Hong Kong. They're doing one in Australia, and they're bringing women together all over the world. How powerful is the community that they've built over eight years? I, 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 you know, I, I, it's amazing. Raj gave up his job recently to do something called bartender boxing. Do you know what he wants to do? He saw a lot of bartenders getting out of shape. He saw a lot of bartenders drinking a bit too much, and he wanted to transform their lives transform their lives. And so he set up bartender boxing. So now, outside your bar at night is not the only place you're going to see a fight. Raj is putting bartenders in the ring together, and I'm sure there's a few bars. I want to see Peter Dorelli go up against Dale DeGroff. I do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but this is another community that's being created. And I don't need to point out how many people are watching this, but this is bartenders supporting other bartenders. It's incredible. So, being true to the roots theme of this, I wanted to use this diagram to say that what's important in life is the roots that you lay down now. Whether they're the mistakes, whether they're the experience, when they're learning from somebody that you really should learn. Because eventually, the tree is of course what everybody sees, but the roots are what are, what are important hard work, persistent late nights, you know, that, whatever that says at the top could be anything. It could be star bartender, it could be anything that you see, but what is down below is essentially what you put in, the patience, the effort, the time, and energy. So, those people, the Peter Dorellis, the Del DeGraffs, the Sasha Petreskis, the Audrey Saunders, the Julie Reiners, they took us from a place when drinks looked like this. And we don't want this to happen again, right? Can I agree there? Yeah? <laughs> and they took us from a place where back bars look like this. Now, I know Tom Cruise can be inspirational to some bartenders, but it's the back bar that I want you to focus on here because right now we have much better back bars. This is the world we want to live in, right? This is where we took cocktail culture. Whether we took it back to classics, whether we took it back to slight innovations, twists on classics. 
This is where it's being taken. This is an amazing world that we need to keep. We do not want to go back into prohibition era type things. We do not want to go back into a place like disco era drinks, in the 70s. We want to remain right here, innovative and at the forefront, and that our jobs and everything that we do is meaningful and that our careers are meaningful. And that one day I can go home to my mum and say, this is what I do for a living, and her not tell me to go and get a proper job. By the way, my mum doesn't believe that bartending is my career. She thinks that because of all the travel, I'm either a spy or a drug dealer. And she doesn't think I'm educated enough to be a spy, so now you know what my mum thinks of me. But we are doing so well in this industry. You can even get good cocktails at music festivals and stadiums now in the United States. We have changed not just the way we drink in small speakeasy bars, but everywhere that we go. So. I'm going to leave you with a little thought. This is the final sort of thought of my talk. And it's also a shameless plug of my gin. But that could be any bottle of gin that's up there. But I just want to sort of paint a small picture of what I find is important about our industry. Um, that might be just a bottle of gin to us in this room and anybody in the world. But that bottle of gin, there was a wheat farmer at some point, And that wheat farmer grew that wheat and provided for his family. That wheat farmer sent that wheat to somewhere that would be distilled into spirits, and someone made those spirits. And then there are, this is juniper farmers in Italy, jasmine farmers in China, Spain, uh, Spanish lemon groves, oris from Italy, coriander from, Indonesia, uh, from Romania, uh, cassia bark from Indonesia farmers in every single one of these situations making these ingredients and products. It's no longer one bottle of gin right now. This is a lot of people's lives. This is a community that's building. Then there's the company that brings the botanicals in, the, been shipping, you know, for hundreds of years, bringing shipping botanicals, brokering botanicals. The community grows larger. Then there's the people that make the bottle of gin. There's the person that built the still. There's the other company that bottles it, the people that ship it and make sure it goes around the world, the distributor that delivers it to the bar, who delivers it to you, the bartender, and you make your incredible creation with it, and then you make a whole bunch of people really, really happy with that creation. That's hundreds of people in the community right there that led to one cocktail that you guys created. That's who we are. That's what we are. That's the economy that we've created. It's the culture we've created, and we should all be very proud of it. Thank you. Woo. And I know I finished early, but it's better not to whittle on and just get it done. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Mr. Simon Ford. Oh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. May I say that's the second best talk that's going to be happening at Barometer. Uh, obviously, if you want to see the best one, come along at three o'clock here uh, to listen to me. Uh, not being humble at all there. Uh, so we'll see you in about half an hour.